I'm joined now by Tulip Sadiq, Nazanin's local MP, who has, of course, been deeply involved in the campaign to free her. Very good to talk to you, Tulip Sadiq. And uh, you tweeted some pictures, a picture of uh, Nazanin on the plane on the way back home. And I get, guess a bit like the rest of us, it's only when you see that documentary evidence that after so many false dawns, you actually believe it's happening. Absolutely, Dermot. And as you say, it's been so many false dawns during the six years that we've been campaigning for her. We've dealt with three prime ministers and five foreign secretaries. And I just saw her husband, Richard Ratcliffe, in Parliament before um, he headed off, actually, in a car to a secret location, effectively, to meet his wife and to be reunited with her. And we were just laughing about the number of times he had been in Parliament. I had taken him into the chamber because I was in the chamber asking for Nazneen to be released. And this time I stood in the chamber and I said, Nazneen is coming home. So all I can say is I'm so happy and I'm so happy for their family. Yeah, we can only imagine the uh, joy of Richard and, of course, Gabriella, their little girl. Let's talk more, though, about Richard's role in all this. Uh, originally, I, I know um, you know him very well indeed. Uh, I've interviewed him over the years. Originally, he was told, wasn't he, you know, leave this to us. Leave it to the Foreign Office. Leave it to the diplomats. We do this through back channels. Don't make too much of a fuss. He eventually then decided, right, this isn't going to work. That's right. So he was told when his wife was initially detained, which was on the 3rd of April 2016, six years ago, he was told that he should stay quiet, the Foreign Office will deal with it, and that if he stayed quiet, he would see some movement on her case. Now, Rich contacted me soon after because he said to me that he didn't think there would be any movement on the case. And he was very, very worried about his wife because bear in mind, she was in solitary confinement during that time. So he had no contact with her. He was very worried that the regime would just disappear her effectively. She would be disappeared and he would just never see her again. So he started this campaign and I took my cue from him because I wouldn't have campaigned if he had felt for any reason that we should keep this information confidential. I took my cue from him. And initially, it was quite difficult, actually, to get journalists interested in this case. And it was quite difficult to make too much noise about it. It all changed a year later when the now Prime Minister, then Foreign Secretary, made an enormous blunder in front of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. And suddenly, everyone was interested in the case. So I suppose the very faint silver lining of Boris Johnson's blunder was that everyone started talking about Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, everyone started being interested in the case, and we got more and more coverage. And I genuinely think it was the publicity and the coverage that made the government do something about the case. And the payment of this debt to Iran, around about £400 million, going back 40 years and more. And the role of the current Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, first of all, in admitting that the UK owed this to the government of Iran. That's right. So in the six years that we campaigned and the countless foreign secretaries we met and the ministers that we met refused to believe us when we talked about the link between Nazanin's imprisonment and the debt that we owe Iran as a country. Now, what I would tell you is that when Nazin was actually in prison, in Ibn prison, the people who captured her said to her, the reason you're being imprisoned is because of the UK's failure to pay this debt that goes back 40 years. So it wasn't a secret that the two things were linked. President Rouhani had mentioned it at Wines, and um, Foreign Minister Zarif had also mentioned it. So it wasn't a secret, but for some reason, it was like hitting your head against a brick wall, because whenever I brought it up with anyone in the Foreign Office, they would just deny the link. Ultimately, it felt like Liz Truss did realise that she had to do something about the debt in order to bring Nazanin home. She was very clear in the chamber today that she has paid back the debt. She didn't go into too much detail about how it was paid, but it was certainly humanitarian aid. And that's why we have Nazanin back. When I asked the Foreign Office earlier in the week if the debt had been paid, they said they couldn't disclose that information. But having dealt with the case for six years now, I know for a fact that there's no way a negotiating team from Britain would have been in Tehran if we hadn't paid the debt. Mm, huge geopolitics involved behind the scenes, behind a, a personal and family story. And what about the Americans in all this? I mean, we understand that originally they said the UK can't pay this money to Iran because of sanctions. They also wanted it linked to American hostages being held by the Iranians. But it seems that that is not happening. 
No, I think initially it felt like Nazanin's case had been caught, been caught up in the nuclear deal, the Iranian nuclear deal. Now, when that President Trump pulled out of that, when that fell apart, Richard Ratcliffe's lawyers wrote a very aggressive and stern letter to the government saying, you had said Nazanin's case would be resolved along with the nuclear deal. Now, what's plan B? What are you going to do now? And I think that did get the government moving because they realized, OK, it's not going to be tied to the nuclear deal because the nuclear deal hasn't been reinstated. And then they must have worked behind the scenes. And I don't know the details, but it sounded like foreign office officials had been working behind the scenes for hours and hours to try and come up with a creative solution to pay the debt back. But what you say about the Americans is interesting because Murad Tabaz, who is still in Iran now, he's out on furlough, but he hasn't come back to the UK, is someone who has British citizenship, American citizenship, and Iranian citizenship. And what I've been told is that Iran is treating him as a dual national from America and Iran, and not as a Brit, and which is probably why he hasn't come back to the country. I'm speculating here, but it seems strange that Anoushe Ashari and Nazanin are now back and Murad still isn't back. And it must be because he is also American. And what about on the personal level? Let's uh, end it on that. Uh, you must be very keen yourself to, to meet Nazanin in the flesh. Uh, presumably you haven't got any plans yet. You, you're going to leave the, the family, first of all, to, to get through what's going to be a hugely emotional moment. And as I was saying a bit earlier, presumably a little girl who's going to be staying up very late this, this evening into the wee small hours. I just saw Gabriella, who is a delightful little girl, and I was finally able to look her in the eye and say, Mommy is really coming home today because I've said it to her so many times and it's been a fall storms. But apparently when she was first told by her father, she didn't believe him and she thought that he was pulling her leg. She then started playing the piano and dancing around the house and being very sweet when she realized that her mother was actually coming home. When I saw her, the utter look of joy on her face, it was really heartbreaking. And Dermot, on a personal level, when you're an MP in opposition, it can be quite difficult to affect change and make legislation a lot of the times. And today it really feels like I made a difference through the campaigning, not by myself, but the whole community and lots of other people. And at least I paid a part in it. Here, here, Tulip Sadiq. Very good talking to you. And congratulations on your tenacity. Very good talking to you.